um, welcome to the fourth annual uh, Queer Directions Symposium, Queer Futures at the Bonham Center for Sexual Diversity Studies. I'm the director, uh, Dana Seitler. Um, this is our first major event, our first sort of using a digital platform uh, since the start of the pandemic. Um, so first of all, I hope you're all safe and well. Um, and second of all, please do keep in mind, this is the, our, the, our first digital performance. Um, uh, in fact, this event, many of you re will recall, was scheduled for last March and we had to cancel it um, as a result of COVID. And so I'm so grateful that all of the panelists were able to um, find a way to join us here today. Um, unfortunately, everybody is here except for Quoley Driscoll, um, who um, had an emergency and so unfortunately will not be able to um, be here um, with us. And, and they, they send their regards um, and their regrets as well. I'm going to begin with a land acknowledgement that is an acknowledgement for the land that the University of Toronto is occupying right now. Uh, um, even though we're all sort of coming from different places as well. So the sacred land on which we operate has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years. This land is the territory of the Huron-Wendat of the Toon First Nations, the Mississaugas of the Credit River, and the nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum, Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still home to indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. Our intersecting communities are comprised of those native to this land, indigenous people from other territories, as well as settlers who have come here by choice, force, or otherwise a result of colonialism and imperialism. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, 94 calls to action reaffirms that the treaties with indigenous peoples must be lawfully honored. We are all treaty peoples and are responsible for honoring and upholding those agreements. We are grateful for the opportunity to work on this territory and to share this space today with all of you. I would also like to take the opportunity to thank Martha McCain and the Global Initiatives Fund um, that allows us uh, to host Queer Directions every year. I want to thank my amazing team at the Center for Sexual Diversity Studies, Valley Weddick, Victoria Liao, and Cameron Crookston. And finally, I want to thank our guests for being here with us today, whom I will introduce momentarily. First, um, just a couple of things. Um, so we were supposed to have closed captions, live captions, um, for you today, and for some reason, we could not get them to work even though we had tested them out beforehand. Of course, at the last minute, they just weren't there. So I do apologize for anyone that needs them. What we are doing is um, recording um, the, the talk, and um, once it's finished, we will send it off to get um, professional live captions done. And then we will upload the video to our website. And so we will alert anybody um, that um, is present here today, that registered today, will receive an email when they're, when they're ready. And so there will also be, we'll both have the video as well as the transcripts. Secondly, this is a webinar. Um, and so the chat is not enabled, rather the Q&A is enabled. And so after we hear the talks, uh, I hope that you all have lots of questions and you will be typing those questions into the Q&A box. And then I will read them out loud to the panelists who will then answer them uh, for you. And I'll remind you of that um, when we're done. First, please let me introduce to you um, the panelists that um, are here with us today. Uh, Kaji Amin is Associate Professor and Director of Graduate Studies in Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at Emory University. His book, Disturbing Attachments, Janae, Pederasty, and Queer History at Duke University Press, de-idealizes Jean Janae's coalitional politics with the Black Panthers and the Palestinians by um, foregrounding their animation by unsavory and outdated modes of attachment, including pederasty, racial fetishism, nostalgia for prison, and fantasies of queer terrorism. His research, which focuses on the disorienting effects of the queer and transgender past on politicized fields of scholarship, 
is published or forthcoming in GLQ, Transgender Studies Quarterly, Feminist Formations, Women's Studies Quarterly, amongst others. Amy Bang is Associate Professor of Gender and Women's Studies at Pomona College. Her book, Migrant Futures, Decolonizing Speculation in Financial Times, also out with Duke University Press, traces the cultural production of futurity by juxtaposing the practices of speculative finance against those of speculative fiction. She is co-editor of the Trans-Pacific Futurity Special Issue of the Journal of Asian American Studies and has published articles on transnational Asian American speculative fiction and financialization in Journal of American Studies, Techno-Orientalism, um, and MILIS. Uh, her second book, Trans-Pacific Ecologies, is currently underway, bringing decolonial, queer, and feminist thought to bear on the environment, knowledge production, and disability at the site of the Pacific Ocean, which has long served as a proving ground for scientific experimentation and biopolitical securitization. Kara Keeling is Associate Professor in the Department of Cinema and Media Studies at the University of Chicago. Keeling's research focuses on African-American film, theories of race, sexuality, and gender in cinema, media, and Black and queer cultural politics, and queer digital media. Keeling's first book, The Witch's Flight, The Cinematic, The Black Femme, and The Image of Common Sense, also with Duke University Press, explores the role, I didn't plan this, explores the role of cinematic images in the construction and maintenance of hegemonic conceptions of the world and interrogates the complex relations between cinematic visibility, minority politics, and the labor required to create and maintain alternative organizations of social life. Her second book, Queer Times, Black Futures, out with New York University Press, considers the promises and pitfalls of imagination, technology, futurity, and liberation as they have persisted in and through racial capitalism and explores how the speculative fictions of cinema, music, and literature that center Black existence provide scenarios wherein we might imagine alternative worlds, queer and otherwise. Um, so please um, join me in welcoming um, all of our guests. I'm so thrilled to have you all here. And I will now turn it over um, uh, to you. And please uh, feel free to present in the manner that I uh, introduced you. So Kaji, uh, Amy, and then Kara. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's such an honor to be here on this incredible panel. And I'm so excited to be in, in conversation with these other panelists. I want to thank the, the Bonham Center and Dana, first of all, for organizing this and inviting us and for organizing this in the time of COVID and online. And thank you also to, to Victoria for the work that you've done to make this happen online. Um, it's so important to have these uh, places of intellectual community at this time. So I'm going to jump right into it um, and share my PowerPoint, first of all. So this talk is entitled Taxonomically Queer with a Question Mark. Um, and in the spirit of queer futures, this is brand new work. So I'm eager to share it with you today. Something has shifted in vernacular discourses about gender and sexuality in the global North. Something that queer theory has not caught up to and that departs discomfortingly from what have been the values and critical habits of queer theorization. In 1990, Judith Butler could still take a heterosexual matrix in which binary gender and heterosexuality followed ineluctably from sex as the object of her deconstructive critique. In 1990, Eve Sedgwick could still write of her first axiom, people are different from each other. It is astonishing how few respectable conceptual tools we have for dealing with this self-evident fact a tiny number of inconceivably coarse axes of categorization have been painstakingly inscribed in current critical and political thought. Gender, race, nationality, sexual orient orientation are pretty much the available distinctions. Today in 2020, Butler's heterosexual matrix has exploded in a way hitherto unimaginable. Vernacular discourses have subdivided the tiny number of inconceivably coarse axes of gender and sexual orientation to which Sedgwick refers into far finer distinctions, each of which opens into an array of possible variations. 
if the heterosexual matrix was a tight and immobile structure, the contemporary system to which I refer works more like a kaleidoscope in which each axis of definition is mobile and can be put into relation with any other axis, making a way for an almost infinite array of variations. The contemporary moment is the result of decades of intra-community, subcultural, and online debates. These deba debates have led to the dissemination in university safe space and trans 101 trainings, in the Asexual Visibility and Education Networks, that's AVEN's well-maintained website, and in Facebook's drop-down menu of 71 gender options, to name just a few key sites, of a new vernacular system of classification. In one version of this system, with which many of you will be familiar, gender, and this is just a snapshot of one part of the system, not the whole of it, gender is subdivided into assigned gender, gender identity, and gender expression, while romantic orientation is separated out from sexual orientation, which itself includes asexual, demisexual, and gray sexual modes. Both sexual and romantic orientation are housed under the master category of attraction, where they bump elbows with aromantic, sensual, and aesthetic attraction. For many, particularly younger people, this system represents the cutting edge of the future of gender and sexuality. It embodies utopian hopes for a world in which no one's gender, sexuality, or orientation would be presumed in advance, and in which everybody would have recourse to a nuanced and nimble vocabulary through which to know, define, and communicate their own unique gender and sexual subjectivity. In this utopian imaginary, which I call combinatorial queerness, gender and sexual liberation occur through a multiplying menu of increasingly specific identity options, and the recombination of mobile axes of gender and sexual subjectivity births quasi-infinite combinatorial possibilities for being. And yet, this utopian imaginary is founded on the method of taxonomy. And what could be further from the queer, which might broadly be glossed as a deconstructive method of troubling categorizations, than taxonomy, a scientific method of establishing them. If queer, trans, and asexual culture in the global north are currently undergoing a taxonomical renaissance, where does that leave the anti-taxonomical sensibilities of queer and anti-racist scholarship? To be clear, I find the scholarly suspicion of taxonomy to be well-founded, and not only because the available taxonomies have been crude and coarse, as Cedric suggests, or because taxonomies are fixed and restrictive, whereas gender and sexuality are idiosyncratic and fluid. The deeper issue with taxonomy is that it is a scientific method that was developed in and through its colonial, anti-Black, and pathologizing uses. The long-time queer and trans scholarly suspicion of taxonomy stems most directly from its usage by 19th and early 20th century sexologists to classify and pathologize a proliferating array of forms of sexual and gender deviance. These sexological taxonomies were created in the service of whiteness, first because sexological diagnoses were individuating principles, whereas racialized people were conceived of as a perverse mass, and second because the interest in white perversion and potential ways of treating it gained import in the context of eugenics and of the establishment of binary gender as the unique evolutionary achievement of whiteness. As a result, Kaguro Macharia characterizes the relation between African queerness and sexological taxonomy as follows. In modernity's archives, African queerness, the queerness of the savage, is not related to the taxonomic sexological marking of gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans, intersex, and the proliferation of conditions and practices described by Richard von Kraft Ebbing. Outside of sexology proper, Anti-Blackness was generative of the taxonomical project of creating racial and species hierarchies, and therefore of the empirical development of, or, or of the development of empirical science itself. As Zakia Jackson argues, an imperialist racist rationale drove a demand for a material basis of scientific evidence in general, and was the engine of species designations in both humans and non-humans. The pursuit of an observable and comparative basis of racial taxonomy and typology is central to the rise of empirical science, an organizing principle, not a matter merely incidental to it. Colonial conquest and expansion vitalize the scientific project of taxonomy. Greta Lafleur characterizes the 18th century taxonomical project of botanical science as based on colonial prospecting, the search for new specimens that would test the validity of existing schemas of classification and that was enabled by colonial conquest. 
Finally, the universalist truth effect of taxonomy was, as Jackson and Durba Mitra both argue, crucial to the project of advancing European epistemologies as the only ones with the status of ontological truth, which meant either derealizing the cosmologies of the colonized or forcing them to be translated into terms commensurate with European universalist schemas. In light of its not just history, is it possible to put a queer spin on taxonomy? This question dovetails with important debates about the status of method in politically informed scholarship. We might boil down these debates as asking whether methods, in particular scientific and social scientific methods that have been part of the project of the objectification of the world in ways organized around anti-blackness and colonial conquest, can such methods be repurposed for more innocent or even progressive ends? or are such methods irreparably tainted by the context of their emergence and the uses to which they have been put. The contemporary queer, trans, and asexual taxonomical imaginary might function as a valuable case study within this debate. Arguably, new queer, trans, and asexual classification systems recontextualize and repurpose the taxonomical method for queer ends. Most strikingly, these new taxonomies emerge from below. They are vernacular in origin and fundamentally undo the doctor-patient, scientist-specimen, and confession interpretation hierarchy that has long structured scientific taxonomies. One might argue that this hierarchy of power rather than the method itself is what has enabled taxonomy to be used to such nefarious ends. What could taxonomy do in the hands of those historically pathologized and abjected by it? Second, these new taxonomies are distinguished by the ethos of self-identification. While a range of websites, videos, and memes engage on the project of defining each term and each classificatory principle, they simultaneously urge users to take up the terms in their own ways and to ascribe their own meanings to them. Under the collective identity model of asexuality, for example, an asexual person, quote, is anyone who uses the term asexual to describe themselves. The label can only be applied internally. No one has the power to create a set of criteria which determine who is and is not asexual. This means that this is a classification system that is willing to renounce true systematicity in favor of idiosyncratic individual interpretations. Indeed, since new queer, trans, and asexual taxonomies were generated through a community de debate and discussion that remains ongoing, the system itself remains mobile and open to continuous change from below, which might include both the further multiplication of existing categories and the redefinition of the principal axes of categorization. What will this system look like and how will individuals be identifying 20 years from now? Like any good queer future, this one is impossible to know or predict in advance. Importantly, the intent of this taxonomical, taxonomical system runs counter to that of typical scientific tax taxonomies. In typical taxonomies, such as biological taxonomies of species, locating a specimen means classing it within a hierarchy of ranks, each of which informs us of its characteristics from the most general to the most specific. The aim of new queer, trans, and asexual taxonomies, on the other hand, is not to locate and fix an individual within a hierarchical pyramid or tree, but rather to put the key axes, gender, sexual orientation, and romantic orientation into motion in order to en enable a nearly infinite range of combinations and therefore forms of sex gender personhood. And that's why the image is a kaleidoscope here. The axes, in other words, are not so much foundations, higher ranks, or general categories as they are non-hierarchical and simultaneous lenses through which different aspects of the same individual might come into view. And that's how you get these lists of identifications, for instance, biromantic, demisexual, non-binary trans men. It is tempting then to regard these new taxonomies as significant departures from biological and scientific taxonomies and as examples of what Eve Sedgwick termed Knott's taxonomies, which Jack Halberstam glosses as ever more accurate or colorful or elaborate or imaginative or flamboyant taxonomies. We might hold our applause, however, to note that this combinatorial use of taxonomy is neither new nor divorced from taxonomy scientific and specifically sexological uses. Combinatorial queerness finds its precedent in German homosexual sexologist Magnus Hirschfeld's 1910 theory of sexual intermediaries. 
um, which you know, in its lushness rivals and exceeds even that of contemporary taxonomies. Hirschfeld hypothesizes that just as there is natural variation on an anatomical level between male bodies, female bodies, and intersex bodies, there is also natural variation between every other aspect of sex. He sets out to taxonomize every facet of sex as a means of mapping out the range of possible variations from a strict sexual binary. His system begins with four basic categories. Um, a, so the A here is, corresponds to A, the sexual organs, B, the other physical characteristics, C, the sex drive, which is a, you know, large category for everything associated with sexuality, and D, the other emotional characteristics, which is a large category for everything we might associate with gender. Just as with new queer, trans, and asexual taxonomies, these four basic axes are mobile. Each may occur in combination with any other. To illustrate this with mathematical precision, Hirschfeld includes three tables, and this is just table one of the three, intended to detail the full range of combinations of these four types, each of which might occur in three variations, labeled uh, with a subscript M, W, or M plus W, or man, woman, or mixture of both, that is sexual intermediary. Fully tabulated, there are 81 possible sexual variations. But this is not all. Hirschfeld notes that each of, each of the basic four axes could be further subdivided into four finer distinctions. And the distinctions he talks about are, are quite hilarious, in fact. Um, I can talk about that in the Q&A. With these additional subdivisions calculated in, the total number of possible combinations rises to 43,046,721, or approximately one third of the total world population at the time. He claims that this number is still too small, proposing that if we were to divide each of the four subdivisions into two finer subdivisions, so for instance, um, dressing in the clothing of the quote-unquote opposite sex into out external clothing versus um, underclothing, right, two divisions, then the amount of possibilities of sexual varieties would overtake the number of the world population. In this intoxication with numbers, beginning numbers through the multiplication of subdivisions, many of which we could challenge as arbitrary or uninformative, Hirschfeld uses taxonomy to reach toward a combinatorial queerness with distinctly utopian overtones. The principle of this endless multiplication is the recognition of the astounding range of forms of natural sexual diversity, a diversity that stretches toward the infinite because, in Hirschfeld's view, humans themselves are individually unique. The number of actual and imaginable sexual varieties, he writes, is almost unending. In each person, there is a different mixture of manly and womanly substances. And as we cannot find two leaves alike on a tree, then it is highly unlikely that we will find two humans whose manly and womanly characteristics exactly match in kind and number. So here he moves towards a kind of universal transness um, or a universal bisexuality in the terminology of the time. What are we to make of these untimely echoes between Hirschfeld's and contemporary queer, trans, and asexual uses of the taxonomical method? One conclusion could be that there is an unacknowledged tradition of taking up taxonomical thinking in the service of utopian queer and trans world-making projects. Another less sanguine conclusion could be that Hirschfeld reveals the sexological roots of contemporary queer, trans, and asexual taxonomies, and in so doing prompts us to fundamentally question the utopian vision behind them. The, oh, sorry, this is the wrong one. Ah, where did it go? Okay, the inheritance of taxonomy brings with it, um, and these are big points, so I, I wrote them out and I'm gonna go through them quickly. One, the conceit that sexological categories are objective, innate, and possibly biologically predetermined. Two, a scientism that animates faith in taxonomy as a significant and meaningful epistemology in the first place. Three, an extension into finer axes and more forms of identity of the biopolitics of gender and sexuality as sites of intensified neoliberal self-management and self-optimization. Four, a universalist Western ontology that downgrades competing epistemologies to the status of the local, the backward, the traditional, or the false conflation. This last point is why, despite originating in and being responsive to vernacular forms of knowledge, these may not be the nonce taxonomies Sedgwick had in mind. Nonce taxonomies, after all, are descriptive, provisional, ephemeral, and local. They do not aspire to become systematizable or universal. 
But part of the reason new queer, trans, and asexual taxonomies are gaining a foothold is that they do take on, albeit contradictorily and unevenly, some of the trappings of objective, systematizable, universalist sexological taxonomies. Even the core presumption of this classification system that gender and sexuality are separate and distinct and that therefore there may be other axes such as romantic orientation that are equally separate and distinct is a sexological invention. As David Valentine and many others have shown, this analytic separation of gender and sexuality has little currency in systems of selfhood that did not originate in 19th and 20th century Western sexology. Tellingly, racial, geographical, and historical difference are either ignored or incorporated into new queer, trans, and asexual taxonomies rather than being treated as potential vectors of epistemological difference, or as uh, in Macharia's words, simply not related to classifications that originate in sexology. As many users remarked upon its rollout, Facebook's menu of genders does not include butch and femme, two identities of great historical and contemporary import, particularly but not exclusively within lesbian cultures. And this is leaving to the side the fact that Facebook as a platform is um, anti-democratic and by no means the site where we want our progressive politics to play out. The presumption seems to be that butch and femme have been superseded by trans, non-binary, and cis, and therefore butches and femmes should just reclassify themselves. Unsurprisingly, the Facebook gender list does not include Black queer genders, such as stud, aggressive, and femme queen, much less genders understood to be local and traditional, such as hijra or travesti. Other lists aspiring to be comprehensive may include some of these terms, and interestingly, almost all lists include two-spirit. But my point is that this is a problem not best solved by inclusivity. The incorporation of genuine epistemological difference as a specimen under the rubric of types of gender identity deracinated from enabling contexts that are about more than gender, such as class, religion, race, labor, and yes, sexuality, can amount to an additional violence. This deracinated, decontextualized, universalist whiteness is the most dangerous inheritance contemporary queer, trans, and asexual taxonomies take from the problematic history of scientific taxonomy. But even this need not be a definitive condemnation. I want to acknowledge the creative and resourceful ways in which Black, Brown, Indigenous, diasporic, and immigrant queer, trans, and asexual people have been disidentifying with these categories in the Munozian sense, reworking them and exposing their normative operations from within. Such disidentificatory performances occur every time a Black, Brown, or Indigenous body lays claim to one of these categories, and I've seen this in particular with non-binary and asexual, while calling attention to the fact that they are usually not the bodies evoked by this category, and even that, on a population level, they may not have access to cisgender binaries or ideas about healthy levels of sexuality in the first place. I am also interested in translations of newer categories like non-binary, trans, and gender fluid into epistemological frameworks that shatter their sexological premises, such as historically and culturally resonant understandings of gender as contextual rather than an internal property of the self, and ontologies of gender as a relation to the divine or to the spirit world. To come clean, my scholarly impulse is to reject these taxonomies outright as unqueer, culturally imperialist and sexological at heart. However, the heuristic of de-idealization I developed in my book, Disturbing Attachments, demands that I attend to ways of living that are undoubtedly queer, despite the fact that they carry problematic inheritances and may not live up to the ideals of politics or scholarship. Whether or not scholars critique it, the queer, trans, and asexual taxonomical imaginary isn't going anywhere. My proposal then is twofold. On the one hand, de-idealize queerness by recognizing that taxonomy can be queer and cultivate sympathy and curiosity toward the identifications, erotics, and life ways opened up by new queer, trans, and asexual taxonomies. And on the other hand, fuck with the universalizing presumptions of the taxonomical method from within and center alternate ontologies of being. That, I think, would be the ethical scholarly approach to new queer, trans, and asexual taxonomies. Thank you. Thank you. I think, Amy, you're uh, going next? Yes, I am. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kaji. 
Thank you, Kaji. That was such an awesome setup and segue into much of what I want to discuss today also. So I'm glad that we continue to be in conversation, even as our new work unfolds before us. Um, okay, um, let me first share my screen. <laughs> um, I think, one second. Sorry. Just want to make sure it's set up the right way. Okay, here we go. Now I can do this and this. Okay. All right, give me a thumbs up if everyone can see that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thanks, guys. Um, So I'm also just really filled with gratitude to be joining this conversation. I've already learned so much from the generative work of my co-panelists, as well as this entire intellectual platform of the annual Queer Direction Symposium, which Dana Seitler has been organizing at the Bottom Center for Sexuality Studies at UT for the past several years. Um, thank you, Dana, for not only organizing us together, but for your introduction and the acknowledgement of the settler colonial conditions under which we're convening our conversation. Um, to extend this spirit of acknowledgement, I wanted to recognize some of the other exigent conditions surrounding our conversation and thank everyone, all of you on the other side of the Zoom screen for joining us here. Um, as we discuss queer futures, I feel it's imperative to resist the normalization of our current backdrop of this collective struggle against the overt and seemingly unapologetic assault on black and brown lives, the climate change induced displacements of people around the world, and the intense grief we must stay attuned to as the daily count of COVID related deaths continues to rise. These are the conditions under which we have gathered today, which is why I want to acknowledge the often taken for granted participation of an audience's presence. Um, thank you sincerely for taking the time and space with us um, to think with us about queer futures at a moment when we might all be feeling what Kaji has called the idealizing strain of queer possibility more than ever. I feel like as I sit down to write and talk to other people who write um, with me, we continue coming back to the difficulty of what it means to produce our work in these times where it feels as though the, the work is both futile sometimes and all the more necessary. Um, I am currently enjoying, is a stretchable word, but um, uh, some time on sabbatical. And uh, as part of my sabbatical, I earned a fellowship in order to enroll in environmental law school. And uh, I have been sitting with the disturbing attachments um, to law as a possible uh, liberatory or emancipatory framework. Um, one of the reasons why I started taking this turn to environmental law was to test my theory that it, especially at the in international level, emerged in response to the devastating fallout of Cold War nuclear testing in the Pacific, alongside the rise of computational assessments of risk. In other words, I've been curious about how the logics of securitization have underpinned environmental law as we know it. I also meant to start, start my time, I'm sorry. Talk about a disturbing attachment, environmental law. In case anyone was wondering, environmental law will not deliver us from um, an ecological future wherein corporations and nation states get to continue extracting from the earth to amass wealth at the expense of black, indigenous, migrant, stateless, and the unbanked peoples of the world. If, if anyone is wondering what the relationship is between the, my thinking about environmental futures and queer futures, Rest assured, this is the topic of my talk today. Um, following Kaji um, and the tradition of this platform, um, I am also presenting new work, although I'm going to be working in very broad strokes. Um, but first, before I get into the meat of it, I just want to take a snippet from our news headlines. 
that makes the case for how environmental um, futures and queer futures are yoked together. Um, the headlines are making the case for me. Um, as I recently learned from my friend, colleague and advisor, Shelley Streeby, Amy Coney Barrett, Trump's nominee for the Supreme Court, is not only a member of the patriarchal fringe group People of Praise, she is also the daughter of a lawyer for Shell Oil. Um, as readers of Kara Keeling's Queer Times the Black Futures will know, um, oops, I lost my thing. Okay, um, let me. Uh, Shell Oil, uh, Shell International's vision of the future is an unabashedly colonial one. It's a terra incognita ripe for exploration, projection, and the potential to capture uncertainty and convert it into an economically reliable set of conditions for profit. When I was hearing about Amy Coney Barrett's household associations with both Shell Oil on the one hand and People of Praise on the other, what struck me was the convergence of two forms of teleological development in her story, the capitalist temporality of extractive development on the one hand and the heteropatriarchal investments in gendered development on the other. Because of the patriarchal teachings of this group, People of Praise, Amy Coney Barrett has vowed to obey her husband and practice a form of surrender and deference to him as an authority in her life, perhaps second only to Jesus. He would be the judge, not her, writes Streeby. According to the rules, she has already agreed to follow in which husbands rule wives and govern their decisions, unquote. The woman who left the People of Praise group, calling it a cult, included um, a bizarre temporal detail in her account of her experience to um, Democracy Now. There was always a list on my wall, she writes, a schedule and men from the community would come in unannounced to check on me to make sure I was on schedule and had done my chores, unquote. Queer theory in particular offers alternatives to the developmental aspirational drives ascribed to heteronormative life courses, right? So queer subcultures, um, if we're following, you know, with the work of Jack Halberstam, uh, produce alternative temporalities by allowing their participants to quote, believe that their futures can be imagined according to logics that lie outside of those paradigmatic markers of life experience, namely birth, marriage, reproduction, and death, unquote. Um, one of the reasons that Halberstam is looking to Samuel Delaney's Times Square Red, Times Square Blue is to illustrate how, quote, queers use space and time in ways that challenge conventional logics of development, maturity, adulthood, and responsibility, unquote. Rather than seeing no future in systems driven by the clock time of sexual and social reproduction, Halberstam, along with Elizabeth Freeman, for starters, limb the potential, the political potentiality of queer failure, refusal, recalcitrance, withholding, and other techniques of disrupting what Walter Benjamin calls homogeneous empty time. As denizens of times out of joint, queers unsettle the temporal ordering practices of what Freeman calls chrononormativity. Um, Freeman's attention to the ways laboring bodies in the industrial era are bound, quote, into socially meaningful embodiment through temporal regulation, unquote, tempered into normative rhythms of work and productivity, directs us to consider the pivotal role temporality plays in aspirational chronobiopolitics, to borrow Dana Luciano's term, of neoliberal futurity. Um, that capitalizes on subjective orientations toward flexible temporalities. Take, for example, flex time to obscure the increased numbers of overtime hours that we do. Um, perpetual schemes of self-improvement, so getting achievement badges for every stage of endlessly upgradable life. Lauren Berlant's notion of the impasse seems particular at, particularly apt as a refusal of this relentlessly anticipatory trajectory of time. For many students of queer theory, um, these arguments will hopefully feel rather familiar. Um, in my current work, I've found that this thinking around queer temporality remains central to a dis disruption of capitalist and heteronormative development, especially when it comes to understanding how racial capitalism produces racial ecologies. So Dr. Keeling's most recent book project and my own share an interest in mapping the continuity across finance speculations harnessing of futurity and longer standing 
the harnessing of financial speculations, um, futurities, and the longer standing processes and practices of leveraging racialized notions of property ownership and modernity into timelines of productivity that prioritize capitalist extraction over Black, Indigenous, and people of color's livelihoods. So what I hope to do with my time today is speak about how I'm beginning to pull these theories of queer temporality through the intersectional matrix of disability, racial, and environmental justice. Um, you might notice on your screen, there's a random picture of a coral reef and this amazing shark that is camouflaged. Um, I will explain what these background images are at the end of my talk. And if I forget, please remind me. Um, but really they're just sort of there as placeholders between slides for you to enjoy and to remember mm, the feeling of water if you're in parched Los Angeles um, and the life of coral if you're at all attuned to the way that uh, those lives are vanishing from um, the planet. Um, okay, so sorry to embarrass you, Kara, I am quoting from your book. <laughs> um, in trying to uh, bring together um, the, not only the kind of newer form of financial speculation that uh, queer futurity hopes to disrupt, um, and the, the longer standing forms of uh, extractive capitalism, um, Keeling writes, the crisis of value that the financial derivative today resolves, however clumsily, extends back through centuries of temporal accumulation, piling up on the bodies of Africans and indigenous peoples present in modernity's most violent scenes of exchange. And in her analysis of M. Norbezi Phillips' um, Zong, um, she's quoting Saidiya Hartman, saying that slavery had established a measure of man and a ranking of life and worth that has yet to be undone because Black lives are still imperiled and devalued by a racial calculus and a political arithmetic that were entrenched centuries ago. I wanted to take that jumping off point to bring together um, the way that racial capitalism um, particularly articulates itself through um, disability histories as well. Um, so I wanted to highlight, oh, sorry, that's not it. Um, bring in to conversation the work of Michael Ralph, um, who's at NYU, and um, this uh, keyword on impairment that I teach regularly to my disability studies class. Um, the concept of impairment, to quote, this keyword, um, thus emerged from the scientific assessments of medical experts, actuaries, and underwriters concerned to fix the monetary value of social difference and debility through family medical history, blood and urine samples, and emerging physiological indices like blood pressure. So this genealogy of the term impairment thus points to a long entanglement of race and disability as proxies for the value of a human life. Um, while we have spent a lot of time thinking about uh, the ways, the calculations around um, how Black life was uh, underwritten as insur in insurance policy during slavery, the concept of impairment um, emerges largely after the abolition of slavery. And uh, Ralph's work um, suggests that one of the reasons that it happens on the heels of the, ab the legal abolition of slavery um, is that it comes to encompass a much wider swath of people um, in order to, to leverage the disability framework that was already latent in the valuation of life um, to much larger swaths of uh, populations. Um, in, in my next move, I'm gonna be explaining how that um, concept and formulation of a impairment and its regulation of bodies and life um, extends then to how environmental law and um, uh, in disaster insurance policies uh, work against, work from this framework already of what, how to calculate harm. Um, that occludes the way that racialized violence has already preceded that calculation of harm. 
Um, but before I get there, I want to um, bring into conversation a couple of uh, race and disability scholars um, to further elaborate on this concept of impairment. Um, here, quoting um, Nirmala Aravel's work, um, when she's reflecting on disability pride narratives, um, Aravel's asked this question, how is disability celebrated if its very existence is inextricably linked to the violence of social economic conditions of capitalism? And um, I forgot to actually uh, include a slide of the response um, from my friend and colleague, Sammy Schalk, who responds to this question, arguing that within the historical and cultural context of American slavery, ableism worked for racist ends against all black people, not merely the ones disabled in ways we would now consider disability. And then Schalk goes on to argue that defamiliarization of realist disabilities resists assumptions about a technologically created disability-free future. And I think that that emphasis on how the defamiliarization of disability works and opens onto a critique of a techno-utopian drive towards cure helps explain why critical, critical disability studies as pulled through the history of, uh, of racialized disability and debilitation um, is precisely where we need to go in order to set up uh, the racialized ecologies that many folks are working on right now. Um, so to that end, um, I wanted to turn to another young scholar um, who is writing um, particularly at this conjuncture of disability justice, racial justice, and environmental justice. Um, since the 1980s, writes J.T. Rohn, uh, policymakers have extended the market logics of risk and profit to encompass all the basic necessities for human life. This financialization of life itself has continued to depend on a racist calculus by which financial solvency and profit are prioritized over Black lives. This is a, sorry to interrupt the quotation for a second. This is a recurring theme in all the environmental legislation that I have read and been slogging through. Um, it is um, to kind of return to the opening query about Trump's nominee to the Supreme Court, alarming to see the number of um, Supreme Court opinions I've been reading um, from increasingly hostile justices, justices increasingly hostile to environmental reform and law um, that, that privilege and that incite over and over again, the importance of a reasonable economic outcome um, to balance out in any sort of environmental justice initiative. Um, what is latent in every single one of those opinions is the dismissibility, the disposability of uh, people's lives themselves who, and so anyway, to get back to JT Rohn, um, who's citing, he's citing specifically the ongoing water crisis in Flint, Michigan, um, as, as exemplifying the disastrous effect of these processes. So Michigan Governor Rick Snyder and his appointed emergency manager for, for the city, Darnell Early, calculated that the health risks posed by, le by lead and carcinogens for Flint's majority poor black residents did not outweigh the benefits of cost saving. If we consider the ecologically destructive forces of plantations financed by speculators, black people's ecological vulnerability underwrote the global market economy, period. And I just feel like this dovetails really well with the work that Kara has been doing um, and where I wanna take this project, this long-term thinking about financial speculation um, into the realm of um, environmental thought. Um, one of the things that I find uh, I've been thinking about in my environmental law studies are is the false promises of enclosure. And this is where I try in the next couple of minutes to just uh, bring everything back to queer futurity, because in the false promise of enclosure, environmental law relies on um, discrete bodies that the environment really is not set up to reflect. So if you think about littoral spaces and the way that land law and water law just can't manage to really address uh, that, that shifting littoral space, um, you can begin to 
glimpse where I'm taking queer theory into this query. So um, for example, one of the things I'm studying is the production of artificial islands and huge land reclamation projects all around the world. But specifically, um, I'm curious about China's development of artificial islands and the Spratly Islands, um, which uh, is in the South China Sea or West Philippine Sea, depending on where you're located, um, politically and ge geographically. Um, in order to increase its claim into one of the most vital shipping lanes and um, resource rich uh, areas of ocean, China is extending its shoreline by dumping sand onto the skeletons of dead coral. Um, I, there's a lot to say about debilitation um, and the environment there, but that's a different talk. Um, I am curious about uh, this use of extending the shoreline in order to extend property rights um, based on these dis discrete notions of land and water. What is a shoreline exactly, um, but actually a very queer space? And I think what I'm thinking about um, is the way that environmental law continuously tries to um, enforce these false promises of enclosure, and yet how the planetary history has clearly demonstrated that such um, discrete bodies, um, these taxonomic fallacies, what Kaji's, oh, Kaji's reference to the anti-taxonomical sensibilities of queer theory they really um, animated in me something about the taxonomies and the, the roles that they play in um, environmental worlds as well. Anyway, so I, what I find is so useful in thinking about queer futures um, in this context of the environment is thinking about queer theories consistent pressures on subjectivity um, as they work um, on forms of human and inhuman as well. And so I'm so glad that Kaji's already brought Zakia's, Imam Jackson's work into the conversation, um, building on a lot of other decolonial work and um, anti-racist work um, that intervenes in enlightenment notions of uh, whether it's Cartesian splits of body and mind or um, uh, you know, enlightenment with white supremacist notions of human and inhuman. Um, the way I'm trying to bring queer futures into conversation with environmental futures is precisely in this area of the littoral space. Um, and it is there that we will find a lot of other stories about environmental degradation that has been slipping through the cracks of the promises of regulation that were never designed um, to protect the planet or the people who live on it, but to shore up the profit-making schemes of multinational corporations. That's my uplifting talk for the day. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, and Kara Keeling, welcome. Hey, thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, hello and good afternoon or evening or morning, wherever you are. Um, it's really a pleasure to have this opportunity to present my work to you um, and, and to give you some sense of, of where my thinking is moving today. Many thanks to um, Professor uh, Dana Seitler and the Bottom Center for inviting me to present my work in this forum. Um, and also to Victoria Lau for her work on the tech I've really been looking forward to being in conversation with, um, you know, the, the other panelists um, from whom I've already learned so much. And after hearing about your new work, I'm even more excited to, you know, talk with you about our shared interests. Um, uh, Amy, I'm really happy to see that we continue to think along similar lines. Um, so I'm especially excited to present this work to you today um, because it allows me to return to and build upon um, my research and thinking that I did for my book, Queer Times, Black Futures, which was published in March of 2019 by New York University Press. So let me pull this up. Um, hopefully it's working for you. Um, okay. So this, this book um, was published in March of 2019 by New York University Press. And I ended that book um, with, with 
um, something that I want to pick up on. And so part of what I want to do today, unlike my um, sort of brave colleagues in presenting new work, <laughs> is to sort of present more of like some little steps from this work into what might become a possible new project for myself. Um, so I ended Queer Times Black Features with the following, and I'm just going to produce, um, I'm just going to read this to you from, from that book. Uh, and it's towards the end of the book. And there's a paragraph that begins at home. At home, in the context of the algorithms and relations characteristic of finance, poetic knowledge returns the body to the living organism and upends the rationale for the violences of finance capital. It prefers not to. By introducing desire in the senses into knowledge production, it disrupts the common habitual relations of signification that allow for prediction and reconciliation between things. It insists that how we come to know what we know is as significant as what we know. And in these ways, it provides a queer way of knowing that flies in the face of calculation and commensuration and empiricism that invites surprises. And then the final page of the book looks like this. Except if you hold it a different way, it's flatter. <laughs> That's basically what it looks like. So when the book was in production, I insisted on this placement of Toward the World on the page. It is a formal choice that I hope reads as an open-ended invitation to collaboration and to further improvisation. It is an incitement to collective action. In this talk, I focus on the last eight words of my most recent book, an empiricism that invites surprises toward the world. I hope that do doing so might contribute to our efforts here to anchor trans queer black feminist futures here and now. So those of you who have read Queer Times Black Futures know that the prompts in the dark at home and toward the world recur throughout it. I also developed them as an analytical method in my essay entitled Electric Feel, Transduction, Errantry, and the Refrain. In that essay, which I published in 2014, I sought to think with and through various pop songs um, in order to enact a feminism that makes a habit of thinking with its ears, and that's from Adorno, um, and a commitment to questioning that habit. In that essay, as well as in Queer Times, Black Futures, I adapted In the Dark at Home and Toward the World from Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari's formulation of the refrain. For Deleuze and Guattari, In the Dark at Home Toward the World are markers of the elements of the refrain. The refrain consists of all of these things at once. Sometimes one element of the refrain is more apparent than others. For example, sometimes it's clear that we are at home rather than toward the world. But in the words of Deleuze and Guattari, quote, these are not three successive movements in an evolution. They are three aspects of a single thing, the refrain, end quote. The refrain is, quote them again, a disruptive and disrupting, uh, or I'm sorry, I'm not quoting them right here, sorry about that. <laughs> the refrain is a disrupting, disruptive and disrupting mo movement that also might provide an anchor for a project or for completing a specific task. It is not linear and ca it can be unpredictable because it has a confrontation with chaos built into it. So with this in mind, the toward the world through which I conclude Queer Times Black Futures is neither a beginning, middle, nor end. It constitutes a refrain. And I take it here today as a place to begin again with an invitation to think together about what it means to invoke queer futures, at least in part through our research, but also through occasions like this, where we have an opportunity for collective engagement, study, and debate, when even in a present forced through violence, precarity, and death, we have an opportunity to interact as if we inhabited a more just world. And one of the things that I'm interested in here is the form of the, um, the, the, the world that is constituted here in this, particular, in this particular form. Indeed, one of the things that has been important to my thinking over the past several years about the themes around which this symposium is organized is the improvisation invited in the toward the world and the significance of improvisation to imagination and the related capacity of acting as if. So in Queer Times Black Futures, the notions of the as if is an anchor 
for thinking and acting in the face of catastrophe. I wrote about it there in the following way. Queer Times Black Futures engages at times contradictory conceptual systems, assembling them nonetheless into a theoretical apparatus that though doubtless constrained by this work's time and place of creation might prove a humble offering for to and for another world breathing here now. Since Black Futures requires acting as if that other world were here now, the audience Queer Times Black Futures imagines is cosmic. In other words, Black Futures requires recreation and imagination, what Franz Fanon referred to as a real leap. End of that quote. So among the implications of these statements is that Black Futures is a feat of the imagination, of an imagination anchored in but not confined by the parameters of the present. The as if here is a creative entanglement with the present rather than a strict adherence to its terms as such. It is a Fanonian leap with the potential to transform the quotidian logics through which our shared reality presently congeals. The as if here builds upon those past struggles, experiments, imaginations of, and yearnings for a future in which black existence and especially black people are cherished and supported and nurtured and looked after and cared for. It is a way to acknowledge that, to paraphrase a t-shirt, we are our ancestors' wildest dreams, while at the same time insisting even so that we can sense the presence of those whom we cannot even imagine, those who might name themselves our wildest dreams. It invokes a queer temporality that is defined not by reproduction, but by errantry, by unpredictable affiliations, and by the living things already anchored in and by those affiliations. In this regard, acting as if those we cannot even imagine might somehow be felt here and now is itself an assault on the conventional methods through which the truth has been produced, such as the insistence on objectivity and measurement, calculation, and data. And I think this is you know, picking up really nicely on the things that uh, uh, Kaji and Amy were both talking about. For if queer black feminist futures require acting as if those futures were actually present here and now within the structures we have been given, it could be said that those futures require us to insist upon a reality that is not accessible to our current methods of verification, calculation, and assessment. For I think we all know that our present reality is held in place by anti-Black racism, by violence against embodied expressions of queer and trans and non-binary genders, and by misogyny, and that it is also undergirded by settler colonialism and a violent hatred and disavowal of femininity, even as at times it purportedly celebrates that femininity. I think too, that we can show and argue this empirically as well. Yet the challenge for black feminists has been to make what we know empirically and intuitively about the quotidian violences that of our shared reality into a commonly shared epistemic regime with the capacity to transform that reality in ways that abolish the violences that keep it in place. In this regard, the challenge posed by the as if is that it is a real leap that calls for both individual and collective effort to enact and inhabit what we do not or cannot yet verify through our conventional systems and standards of measure. Though many philosophers and theorists have written about the as if, the formulation I chose to use in Queer Times Black Futures is from the Italian autonomist Franco Bifo Berardi. And one of the reasons I turn to Berardi is because his focus, um, his primary focus like mine has been on media and information technologies in contemporary capitalism. So drawing on his book entitled After the Future, I wrote in Queer Times Black Futures, for Berardi acting as if is a way of holding in reserve a radical imagination that approaches the limits of knowledge, not as a problem to be overcome, but as a possibility, as a condition of possibility for a new relationship between the environment and the human organism to be called forth by the radical imagination. So nurturing and protecting a radical imagination has been one of the purviews of black feminism. This has happened in myriad ways. Today, we are called to do this in the face of a global struggle between fascism and authoritarianism and an entrenched but shaken neoliberal epistemology 
that seeks to limit the parameters of what can currently be known to that which can be accessed through the market. And all of these um, are, are saturated and supported by white supremacy. So in the context of today's gathering and the shared task it articulates in its refrain of queer futures, what I want to underscore about the as if is that it can be animated by a radical imagination and that this imagination is creative and generative. It works by creating and enacting, and enacting whatever it imagines. It insists that when we invoke queer futures, we not only move in that direction, we proceed as if we inhabit a world indexed by the content of the imagination queer futures invokes. So it's worth noting, and this is important, that the imagination itself is a faculty for ex, uh, at, is a faculty for accessing, accessing and enacting the as if, and the as if is an operation that might also be used in ways that are antithetical to the interests of queer black feminisms and their futures. Um, white supremacy, neoliberalism, and fascism also all harness the imagination, access to and control over the imagination of peoples, their varied poetics are increasingly what is at stake in surveillance capitalism and societies of control. Nurturing various manifestations of radical imaginations then is one way to anchor alternatives to those structures of command. What would it feel like to inhabit a world that is structured by relations that are not defined by capitalism, misogyny, settler colonialism, white supremacy, and violence? What aesthetic and formal logics anchor the epistemic regimes of such a world? In the dark. The last time I gave a public presentation was in January of 2020. I spoke then of some of these same themes. I played with the idea from Queer Times Black Futures that uh, I played with the idea from Queer Times Black Futures of an empiricism that invites surprises because I was concerned with the confluence of algorithms, imaginations, and epistemologies enabling the right wing insistence on the existence of what they call fake news. As right wing fake news claims accelerate, it becomes difficult to determine the fact to determine fact from fabrication. And we are all called to participate in it to varying degrees. The situation is designed to insist that we act as if what can be empirically verified is just as valid as any lie, as long as enough media consumers believe it. If they believe it, it can become an impetus for action in and on the world. Today, I return to these themes while a non-hierarchical and re-energized movement for Black lives bravely helps more and more of us imagine, uh, to imagine abolishing the police and enacting radical proxies of mutual aid, even in the face of, a re of reinvigorated neo-fascist movements. And COVID-19 is revealing, once again, the entrenched and systemic nature of racism, which, lest we forget, Ruth Wilson Gilmore aptly defined in her book, Golden Gulag, as, quote, the state-sanctioned or extra-legal production and exploitation of group-differentiated vulnerability to premature death, end quote. With an empiricism that invites surprises, I aim to anchor my work in the thick complexities and contradictions of the felt present while holding that present open to what is incalculable, incalculable errant, and unknown within it. It offers one way of, tethering, of untethering imaginations and predictions about the future from those that govern the present because it does not accept that the official organization of things is all that can be perceived and known now. At home, queer futures are here and now too. Many of us have gathered together today virtually from our homes. What was thought to be a private sphere of the home is increasingly also public. We allow technologies of surveillance and control. In Queer Times Black Futures, I suggest that politics that refuses the terms of privacy, property, and propriety that have been given to us might invite the cascade of surprises through which new relations between living organisms and our environments might take root and flourish. While this might no longer be a properly human future, 
It is a future for which what we call blackness, queerness, and transness are preparing us insofar as they have negotiated the vulnerability and violence of public life. They have been preparing us for this future through experimentation, radical imagination, and I think an empiricism that invites surprises. It is a future whose spatiotemporality is here and now. If, as Fanon says, the true leap is to introduce invention into existence, then there are no queer futures except those into which we are leap leaping now. Some we can perceive and some we cannot, and some of them we cannot even imagine. And so I end where I began with an open-ended invitation to collaboration and further improvisation in the middle of things, in the thick of it, toward the world. Thank you so much. Um, okay, everybody, um, uh, um, please start uh, typing your questions into the Q&A and I'll try and sort through them. And maybe while I'm doing that, if the three of you want to speak to each other about what you've um, just presented and I will be joining you with questions in a moment. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was so fun to um, <laughs> yeah. to one another and like hear the conversations across the screens. Um, a couple of points that I I heard coming through all three of our talks were sort of about like data tax, taxonomies and like what what empiricism means to queer, queer futures, um, what the relationship is there, and then the other thing was um, you know the question of the human. So. I don't know. I, I, one of the things that struck me um, in my own research was uh, realizing the extent to which uh, securitization practices and the period that I'm looking at in the mid 20th century um, and environmental, the emergence of international environmental law was so dependent. Even the notion of an ecology was so dependent on the com computational capacity of the technology at the time. So, from the 19, you know, 60s and 70s, you know, that's really when data starts to become um, uh, gatherable from multiple sites around the planet in real time, and so that there there can be even like comparative sort of notions of ecological study. So like ecological science didn't really happen until that computational data emerged. And um, I just think about the structures that so many other structures, um, whether it's law or medicine, um, scientific research or whatnot that rely on these computational foundations that we are ultimately trying to interrogate. I think that's really great. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. No, okay. Oh, okay. Well, and then I'll just say quickly, I mean, Amy, I think, you know, that's one of the things um, I'm really excited um, about in your work is because I feel like, um, you know, coming off your, your, your Migrant Futures book, which I think, you know, was, did a really, um, uh, a really good job of sort of laying out um, issues around finance capital and, and speculation, I think, you know, the role of science in many of the things that we're talking about, I think is one of the things that we're, 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 we're really turning towards, whether it's through data or I think as Kaji was doing in terms of taxonomy or as you're doing in terms of ecology. Um, and I think, I think that's, you know, sort of enriching um, the work that, that people have already been, already been doing, obviously, um, in queer theory. Um, but I, I, I also, in terms of data, like one of the things that for me has become really interesting to think through is the way that um, the, not only the way that sort of like, you know, we can talk about big data, right? But the, also the, the interest in the questions around privacy um, and, and publicness, right? Um, caught up also in these things around around calculation. Um, yeah, that, and to respond, um, I think that's a really great thread between the three talks, this interest in data and empiricism. And, um, and for my part, um, I, I'm interested in the seduction of the, what's 
the, the empirical, right, or what seems to be empirically verifiable in these queer and trans taxonomies, right? Um, so, and the, it's quite contradictory what's going on here, right? Because Hirschfeld is trying to say that no two humans are alike in terms of their manly and womanly characteristics. Well, if that's the case, why in the world would you try to divide it into four different types of, of sexual variation and then divide those into four and then try to calculate numerically the number? You know, it's a, it's a very strange project, you know, to try to hold those two ends together and to use one in the service of the other. Um, but for Hirschfeld, taxonomy is absolutely necessary because it is science itself at the time, right? So it's about legibility. It's about a move towards universalism, right? It's about turning sexology from something that, that has to do with sex and, and is invalidated, right? Into something that has global world historical significance, which occurs through, you know, interface with eugenics and, and a discourse about race and, um, and reproduction, right? Um, when it comes to new queer, trans, and asexual taxonomies, there's a similar kind of tension going on um, because with self-identification, any of these categories could mean anything, right? Um, it could mean whatever any individual wants it to mean. So that's not systematizable, right? Um, but on the other hand, there's this move towards naming things and listing them, right? Creating charts that show the relationship to one another, defining different axes of categorization. Like there's, I think, a real drive towards that, which I think also has to do with legibility, right? It has to do with, with saying to um, people who are not identifying with these categories, this is how they work, this is why they're legible, this is how they make sense, this is why this is not just something that some small subculture, um, a set of words that it uses to describe itself, but something that um, can be taught, right, is pedagogical, right, can be, um, and, and I think that's actually the danger in that kind of universalizing premise that that's built on. Mm -hmm. No, that, I think that's why speculation is such an interesting word for me because it is this attempt to yoke empiricism to imagination as methodologies. I have several questions now too, so, and already I have questions upon the, the things we've already said, but I'm gonna read these. Um, so this is from Catherine McKittrick. Uh, can Kara Keeling talk more about how black queer feminism is simultaneously a narration of violence and an insistence on um, and practice of collective or a collaborative dismantling. Did I get that right? If I did, can she expand more on how she works through, theorizes this tension between descriptive violence and the as if of collaboration? Okay, so I'm sorry, but uh, this form, form is, is a little bit more difficult. I haven't done a Q and A in this form yet, but hey, Catherine. Um, <laughs> um, so, okay, could you read, I'm sorry, could you read just the first part of it? Cause yeah. I got the second. So yeah. how, uh, uh, talk more about how black queer feminism is simultaneously a narration of violence and an insistence on and practice of collective or collaborative dismantling. Which I take from the, the description, right? The, the, the insistence on having to describe the violence and also the collaboration against it. Mm -hmm. And then how that relates to the as if. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I think, I mean, I think, you know, that, that for me, one way that I've tried to think about um, a kind of history of, of, of Black feminism along these lines is to say that. Um, and uh, certainly I'm not the only one who's said this. I mean, you know, lots of people I think, I think ha have said this, but that there's a way in which the sort of impetus is not only towards the kind of critique and description, but also towards a kind of way of, um, a way of, of living, um, I guess, for lack of a better word right now, but a way of being in relation um, uh, that is, can, is about a kind of experimentation with, um, within the limits of whatever time period we're thinking of, right? So for me then, if I think about what is really compelling and exciting to me about Black feminist thinkers, um, like yourself, <laughs> right? Uh, 
it would be, you know, that there's really a kind of will to experiment. There's a need to push knowledge out of its traditions to bring in other things. So there's cross flows between like, you know, sort of like activism, um, you know, uh, philosophy, poetry, mathematics, uh, in the case of your work, Catherine, um, et cetera, that I think sort of point to a different way of producing knowledge that is not only about the production of knowledge, but also about a kind of way of thinking about what that even, um, what, it, uh, what it affords and what it, might, um, what it might enable. So I think in terms of the as if, part of what I wanna say is we have that history of, we have a very long history of black feminisms, right? and of different sort of ways that we might think about that term. And I'm not thinking about it only in the academic sense or only in the sense of feminism as it can be recuperated into something that's recognizable to us as feminism, right, right now. Um, but we have this like really rich sort of past of that that's, that I think is always informing our present. Um, and this is this is a way that I've thought about temporality, so that it just it's not just that something is done and 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 gone, but that all of those efforts are there in the present, in the moment, you know, um, and uh, they might also they might also persist and and bolster the as if. Um, I, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's. That's what I'm hearing. There's, so, there's way more questions that we could, can answer. So I'm also going to say that I will pass all of these questions along to the panelists because um, your names are attached. And so maybe you can have a conversation beyond this because there's like 20. Um, so this is a question for Kaji. Thanks so much for the presentation. I wonder if we could extend some of the problems and possibilities with queer taxonomies to the now widespread practice, even normalization of announcing and identifying with pronouns. For example, are pronouns part of a queer taxonomy that can do similarly liberating and limiting work? Are there possibilities of disidentif for disidentifying with pronouns? Thanks, that's a- And that's from Roshaya Rodness. Thanks, Roshaya. That's a fantastic question. And I think you really, uh, pointing out a connection between these taxonomies and um, the contemporary, um, you know, new habits about using pronouns, right? Especially this this idea that good practices to always um, sign uh, emails, you know, with your pronouns to um, in a new group of people or in a classroom to ask everybody their pronouns and uh, and you know to mark them on the kind of uh, labels that have your name and your institution on them as well, right? Um, and, uh, and pronouns are a form of categorization, right? And, um, and I think like, like these other taxonomical forms, they play a certain role, right? The idea is that through revealing pronouns in this way, um, you avoid being um, ascribed, you know, a certain gender, a certain pronoun, right? Um, but, um, but it, you know, there's a kind of, um, I don't know, compulsion, right? That one must, identify with a category of pronoun, one must make that known, right? Um, and some people have pointed out that um, if you come from um, a culture where language use doesn't differentiate between um, personal pronouns that are masculine and feminine, right? Um, or um, if, you, um, if you are in a setting where you don't feel comfortable revealing your pronoun because that might reveal something about um, your identification that that could put you um, in danger or expose you in some way, right? This practice then um, you know becomes less liberatory than it seems, right? Um, but I uh, but mainly I just want to say yes. I think it's the exact same type of issue, right? Um, this idea that categorizing um, people as long as you know there's a larger range of categorizations and as long as people have the ability to categorize themselves 
is essentially a good thing and a liberatory thing and, um, and something that needs to be institutionalized, right? Something that we all need to do. And so even though neither of these are institutional practices in the traditional sense, right? There aren't brick and mortar buildings or funding or, uh, you know, institutions divide, uh, devoted to these kinds of queer taxonomies, right? Um, I think they're spreading in other ways that, um, that in practices, right? That have a certain institutionalizing effect, right? Um, so, so that's my answer to that. Thank you. Great. Um, and this is for Amy. It says, Amy promised to expand on the picture of coral. <laughs> Fair game. Um, yeah, you know, my my buzzer went off and I'm like, okay, I'm not gonna go on and on. But uh, if I, thank you for the question because that lets me finish it out and I'm gonna share my PowerPoint again for like two seconds. Um, so all the images that you were seeing um, that were sub uh, aqueous um, were still images from this uh, 40 minute IMAX movie documentary I think you can stream it on Netflix, whatever, called Journey to the South Pacific. And it's narrated by Kate Blanchett. And there's like 40 minutes of an example of how, of like a very settler colonial approach to environmentalism that is also very much about reproducing all forms of like heteronormative um, relationships to the planet that are about um, ultimately tourism. There's this one story, uh, where uh, it, generally the, the documentary opens and is about this, follows this one educational boat around um, uh, various islands in West Papua. And, um, you know, it's narrated somewhat from the perspective of um, a young uh, boy uh, who is taking up his uncle's call and the scientist uh, call on the boat to learn about his reef for the future. And um, this, uh, we learn that one of the biggest threats to the reef ecologies there is uh, both like overfishing locally and um, outside poachers who have come in. And um, this white uh, British couple um, appears on screen. There are some gratuitous shots of like string bikinis and such underwater and beautiful diving um, visuals um, about have, have they noticed that the coral reefs were in danger. And so they, um, worked with uh, local fishermen to um, fisher peoples um, in order to uh, figure out like what an appropriate amount of fishing is for sustainable reef ecologies. Um, and also as long as they could get the outsiders to stop poaching. And there's like a whole like occluded story here that I'm not sure I'm hearing, but it, it sounds as though there's like a kind of local policing effort that got set up. And because the boats are seen like patrolling uh, for these um, outside poachers. And then we get this shot of, and then the couple, the British couple who came up with this idea, um, fulfilled their lifelong dream to set up an ecotourism spot um, right in these, on these reefs that then funds with their profits, like the, I think the policing efforts. So it's unclear exactly what's happening, but I wanted it, I, I was thinking about the way that uh, coral reefs have been subject to a, a huge amount of, of environmental speculation and legislatively the occasion for the urgency is that we are now subjecting to the reefs to calculations of gross domestic product. So in 2014, the Asia Development Bank reported that the gross uh, domestic product of the marine ecosystem called the um, Coral Triangle, which is what this um, documentary is about, reaches $1.2 trillion per year for over 120 million people. So now that there's like this attached uh, figure, um, that opens up all sorts of other uh, uh, directives about protecting and you know, and some of them are great, you know, marine protection uh, areas, MPAs is sort of like the, the ideal end product. But again, it's sort of like this um, fixing of an ecosystem to a financial figure that is ultimately facing um, the profit of, I'm actually suspecting the outside poachers in a global economic, economic system that's occluding the kind of uh, uh, racialized exploitation of these resistance. There's just a lot more to say, but I want to preserve time. That that's sort of the skinny. Um, okay, great. So now, wait, I just lost the question I was going to ask. Um, and so this is from Kiva 
we. Uh, across the talks, there's a strong critique of the utopian turn to scientific thought as a method for validating queer identities and taxonomies. I'm curious to hear more from the panelists about how these colonial epistemologies come to bear in the world of queerness and what is at stake for queer knowledge production. This is a, I, know, I can reread this if you need me to, in relation to decolonial anti-racist imaginaries in unsettling the political investment in empirical and objective knowledge. Here I'm also thinking about contemporary demands for politicians to listen to scientists and the problematic championing of science as an apolitical form of thought. So that's for all three of you. Who wants to go first? <laughs> Looks like Kaji does. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just, I'll jump in. He brought it up. <laughs> to, to my talk. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is actually, um, yeah, this is, this is something that, that I'm a bit um, obsessed with when it comes to contemporary, you know, queer, trans, and asexual identities. And, um, and it's the, the question of the, the colonial and racial inheritance of these identities, right? Um, and of, and therefore, of the cultures of, um, and, and in some cases, the political imaginaries um, that bear these identities as a part of them, right? Um, and I think that it's, it's easy in a way to make really foundationalist critiques of identity, of taxonomy, you know, of empiricism and things like that. But what I'm trying to figure out in, in this work, you know, kind of as a question of scholarly method, but also of ethics, right, is how to deal with the fact that in the present, right, these communities um, that I think scholarship actually has to be, um, uh, has to answer to in some way, right, can't totally disavow them and say, you know, you're so, you're, you're not radical, goodbye, right? Um, but to deal with the fact that, that these communities are, um, are building upon some of these inheritances and carrying some of these inheritances with them, right? And, um, and I count myself among this, right? Um, I may be a little bit too old to, to subscribe to, to these, like this, this recent explosion of categories. Um, but when I was coming of age in my, in my 20s, you know, when I was coming into uh, my own identity, as a trans fag, you know, that would not have been possible if the, the divergence of gender from sexuality, the possibility of being, um, you know, masculine presenting, um, female bodied, but not attracted, you know, attracted to masculine people, right? If that divergence hadn't become popularized as something possible and legible, right? My identity would not have been possible, right? But if you trace that back, that divergence between gender and sexuality comes from sexology, right? Which is part of this colonial and anti-Black project, right? Um, and I think that divergence is the kind of core divergence that is now spawning these other divergences, you know, of romantic orientation from sexual orientation and so on, right? So, um, so I think many of us here, you know, actually bear this kind of inheritance. And so one thing that I'm, I'm, I'm asking us to ask ourselves, right, and to ask ourselves as scholars and as individuals is um, what does it mean to be in some ways after effects of sexology and white supremacy, right? Yet at the same time, to have these politically radical imaginations and to engage in activism that has to do with much more than just identity. Right, uh, because identity is not the core of it all. So, thank you. Yeah, I, I think I would maybe maybe approach that and add, add to uh, that. I mean, for one thing, I, I I think I don't think that in anything that I said or really that I heard anyone else say, although you all can speak for yourselves, but um, I don't think there was a sense that we were saying don't trust the science, especially you know around. Um, things like, you know, um, uh, climate change, you know, or saying don't trust the facts, right? I think it was sort of more about um, saying uh, that the history of knowledge production, including science, right? Not only science, because we could say the same about the humanities, we could say the same about other sort of um, uh, disciplines, right? So the kind of history of knowledge production is not divorced from the workings of power that have 
um, shake, shake the world that we live in. So I think for me, like what is at stake in terms of um, thinking about these, these questions and actually sort of having a more, uh, a kind of more robust conversation that I think has been, has been growing um, with sort of computer scientists, for example, with, uh, with you know, people who are, who are working on tech, with people who are doing environmental science. Part of that, I think, is to actually begin to um, enable perhaps a different kind of exchange, a different, a different mode of, of, of knowledge production within the history of those fields, right? Even if it means breaking with the history of those fields to a certain extent, but I think that question and one of the reasons that I would hold on to something like empiricism, even if it is an empiricism that invites surprises, even if it is one that allows for sensual knowing through the senses and through intuition and through just other ways of knowing is that I do think there is a way that part of what remains important is for the um, sort of way that queerness, transness, blackness, indigenous, um, Ness, right, has produced and continues to produce knowledge um, from a different, uh, fr fr from, a, from a perspective that actually is in direct sort of confrontation, if not antagonism, with um, the ongoing consolidation of power that, that the things that I think we're tracing in science have supported and perpetuated, right? Um, yeah, I guess I'll stop. I'll stop at that point. And I can make mine super short. I keep thinking about Donna Haraway's uh, proliferation of monsters, right? When it comes to taxonomies and lists or whatever, a lot of the problematic history uh, that we understand through statistical science and its relationship to eugenics is about the logics of elimination. So these, the production of these lists in order to eliminate um, is something that I think carries on through, say, like the Human Genome Project, where you're presented with a normal quote-unquote genome, and to which everything else is supposed to be snapped to, um, and uh, gen genetic aberrations are supposed to be excised, right? And this is an eliminationist, eugenicist use of taxonomic information. But the empiricism that Donna Haraway is kind of invested in, in terms of like a feminist genealogy of science, is really about the proliferation of categories of names or whatever, to the extent that it, it renders the, the, it unmoors the function of, of taxonomic fixation, right? I'm gonna stay with you here, Amy, because I have another question for you. Sorry. <laughs> uh, this is from Dai Kojima. Uh, thanks so much for the presentation on your illuminating and timely work. Uh, can you speak, to, if this is an area you're attending to, can you speak to the relations of eco-crip critique and queer futurism, i.e. Yun Jung Kim's curative violence uses an idea of time of the time machine to imagine a world beyond the future restoration or cure or erasure of disability that disability promises uh, or of disability promises. How does paying attention to disability enable a different kind of ecological critique against speculative for futurism in your work? That's exactly right. Um, for me, the the disability justice thread of that so much of what I've learned from reading in critical disability studies has been about working against this, uh, the normalization of sort of a race towards cure, right? And I think you've um, captured it um, really well. And so I think um, the, the way that uh, disability justice scholars are kind of like uh, undoing a lot of the assumptions of what a normal body um, uh, how a normal body presents and interacts with the world and what needs in its interactions with other uh, creatures and you know planetary materials etc environments um, is, is something that that can't be taken for granted as like a distinct thing that is on an evolutionary path that it has a very clear um, solution and um, uh, a reparative move that is about like remediation of environments back to some sort of pure form, right? And so I think that disability justice is asking us to not um, calculate a future where a few pure human bodies like remain um, and the planet is somehow uh, saved, uh, but it, it's calling for a, a form of adaptation of improvisation to use Kara's language um, that I think is 
latent in a lot of black feminist and queer theory as well. Um, that we, uh, the, the formulation of adaptation of change is something that, you know, I learned first from as a kid reading Octavia Butler as like, you know, a young queer trying to think about what, um, I don't know, how the, of becoming, right? <laughs> so this is the Deleuzian thread that I can also trace through Kaji Kairos in my own work. Um, I should stop there. Um, I ha we have enough time for a couple more questions and then the panelists can decide if they want to do more than that, but there's way more than we can answer here. And as I said, I'm going to repeat that I'm going to you know, save all of these questions and share them with all of the panelists um, because they're great. For Dr. Keeling, how might practices of imagining new expressions of black life ask us to think not simply inter-transdisciplinarily, but towards the destruction of disciplines? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a good question. I think in Queer Times Black Futures, I talked uh, a bit more about interdisciplinarity um, than I did about sort of like a destruction of disciplines. But I think there's a way in which the interest that I had in talking about interdisciplinarity was actually about a destruction and kind of, um, I, I guess I wouldn't, I wouldn't say destruction in that sense, but a kind of way of sort of remaking um, disciplines into something else, perhaps, right? So, for example, um, I think one of the ways that I've thought about this is along the lines of how... Uh, Stuart Hall described um, the Center for Cultural Studies when he said, you know, we, we had a kind of, we, we, we took sociology and we, we said to sociologists, like sociology is not what you think it is. This is like, you know, we're doing something else with it. Um, and I think, I think there's a way that for me, one of the things to understand about the disciplines is that they are a record of power themselves, right? So they're not divorced from the things that we're talking about. But at the same time, if you only see them as kind of a record of power, um, you miss the ways that in order to gain that power, they have had to sort of subvert, incorporate, um, sort of obfuscate um, other challenges to that power. And I think um, we, it's important to recognize that all, most of the disciplines have also had these kind of undercurrents or subterranean knowledges, if you want to take a Foucauldian term, that um, that have fed them and that that can't um, we can't destroy them without also destroying the things that have also fed them, even if they're not those things that are um, at the forefront of the logics of the disciplines. So I guess what I would say is that. Um, I think it is important still to see the way that interdisciplinarity can become something, even as it is sort of also managerial logic, we could talk about that too, but, but interdisciplinary, in, interdisciplinarity can become something that's actually sort of generating different ways of organizing knowledge and of, of disorganizing knowledge that can, can actually mine those existing disciplines for those things, um, or, or mine is perhaps not the best word, but you know what I'm saying, you get the point, right? I hope, because um, I can't see you, I have no idea, but you know, that actually are, are, are reaching into those other disciplines in order to sort of uncover and revitalize, perhaps um, even in some ways recover things that are part of that discipline that have been pushed to the side or um, rejected uh, for various reasons. Okay, so this question is going to be for Kaji. To Kaji, this is from Mint Marcellus. To Kaji, I loved your talk, particularly as a child, the wild Tumblr days of a decade ago, where so much of this new taxonomical approach emerged. The question I have for you is how the reclaiming of queer as an umbrella term works with or against the ethical position you described. In my conversations in my queer communities, this has often been characterized as a response to what felt personally to us as a lack 
the lack left in um, tax taxonomic logics we had all participated in years ago. And there seems to be a struggle to elaborate that position while also celebrating the names and categories that are a source of life and expression for so many in our queer families. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And, um, and I think this is at play both in queer subcultures in terms of tensions between different types of identification. Um, you know, queer as this umbrella identification or, or as an identification that, that is not taxonomically specific on purpose, right? Um, versus, um, versus these more taxonomically specific ones or queer as, you know, one among an option of other taxonomical identifications, right? Um, but we also see it, I think, in scholarship, and this is one thing that I'm really interested in, um, in the divergence between queer, trans, and asexual as analytics, right? And, you know, and, and asexuality studies is, is very new still, um, but what I see, you know, I, I think it's very interesting in all three of these fields, um, you see a real interest in the, the analytic rather than identificatory um, use of queer, trans, and asexual, right? Um, and I think that, that that is part of the fact that these fields, particularly in the more kind of theoretical and humanistic iterations, have not really dealt with, um, with this, this taxonomical explosion that is happening, and that is one of the most visible and evident and known about to the mass public aspects of queer, trans, and asexual culture, and to our students, right? Uh, whenever I'm teaching, um, student, when I'm trying to get students to kind of problematize given ideas about gender and sexuality, nowadays what they're most likely to do is respond with one of these categories and say, okay, here's an example, gender fluid, right? Or here's an example, non-binary. Um, so the category itself answers the question of trying to problematize categories, right? Um, so, so I think that, 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 that to me is a really fascinating divergence and it happens within my, my talk as well, you know, I use queer as an analytic to ask whether these taxonomies can or cannot be queer, right? Um, but then I'm also referring to queer culture as a kind of um, almost empirical scene that is generating all these categories, right? And, um, and that divergence is actually right where I situate my scholarship, right? Um, in this question, of the divergence between theory um, and uh, and culture, right? Or the you know the empirical and the theoretical, and um, and the asking of one to be accountable to the other. So I guess what I'm saying is that I don't see this as a resolved or as a resolvable problem, right? But I'm seeing this as something that we really need to point out and be aware of because it, it can be quite contradictory and it can be intention and these terms can operate in very uh, in ways that really rub up against one another, in ways that um, I think often don't get acknowledged, rather, whether in scholarship or in uh, in culture. Okay, thank you so much. I'm. Uh, how do you? Feel? I should I should be the moderator and say shut down the questions, but they're still they're still coming in. There's one more general question left that addresses all the panelists. So maybe this would be a nice way to end by having each of you address this question, and then um, I'll bring this uh, to a close, if that's okay with everybody. I know we've asked you to do quite a lot, um, but it's really actually very exciting to see all these questions from everybody. So thanks so much to the audience that's here. Um, I know we can't see you and we really wish we could be present together. And um, I'm just so happy we could do something um, to begin to think about the future. Um, and its queerness. So this is a general question um, from Kyler Chittick. Uh, I'm wondering where our speakers stand with respect to the anti-relational thesis in queer theory. It strikes me that today's presentations would fall into the category of relational queer theory a la, a la Munoz, although much recent scholarship on queer theory and eco-criticism, for, for instance, particularly by Steven Swarbrick, rejects the paradigm of queer relationality. Do our speakers subscribe to the notion of relational versus antisocial queer theory? Is this still a re relevant mode of organizing queer thought? So this brings it out a bit. I'm going to do the thing that you're not supposed to do and just say, I don't know Steven Swarbrick's work. And um, so I can't respond responsibly. However, I will look it up. <laughs> and, but the, I think more generally, we can probably respond to the relational question. Um, and for me, I, it's, uh, if, if the, 
conditions of producing work in the quarantine <laughs> in social isolation has produced anything in me. It is the resounding answer that we I am nothing if not relational. As a thinker and as a student of queer theory, I, it, it absolutely for me is relational. Is it, did I miss the question though? I, I, I'm trying to find it again. It's more or less. I think you can see, yeah, do you, if you can see the Q&A. Okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. And I would say for that, for me, rela relational versus anti-relational is, is, for me personally, not an interesting binarism within queer theory um, uh, right now. Um, <laughs> speaking of categories, right? Uh, <laughs> it's, it, it, is, it is such a binary categorization. And, um, and I think, you know, I am really interested in, in the place of the negative within queer theory, which could be categorized within the anti-relational, but for me, it's not actually about relational versus anti-relational or social versus asocial, right? Um, because um, I'm very interested in relation, right? I think that these, the, these identities, these cultures, these politics always, always emerge in relation, right? Um, but that is not to say that does not automatically mean that they're utopian or that they're progressive or any of these things, right? Relation can be anything. Relation is everything, right? Um, so, so I'm very interested in thinking about relationality, but not according to this relational, anti-relational binary. I'm very interested in thinking about the force of the, the negative, right? But also not in the relationality, anti-relational binary. Um, so, so that's just my answer for myself. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think I would, I, I mean, I have, I mean, it's interesting because in some ways, like, um, I, I started writing Queer Times Black Futures actually like 10 years ago. So <laughs> actually more now because it's been 11 or 12. And one of the things that kind of made me start working on it was the no future, no future um, uh, d debate, right? So the Edelman's uh, no future and then they kind of, you know, critique Jose Munoz and a lot of other people sort of had of that. Um, but to me, it was really compelling because I think as Kaji just said, I also was interested in the work of the negative in a kind of way that the anti-relational also dovetailed with a way that people were starting to think about blackness in terms of antagonism um, and in terms of sort of, you know, uh, ways of thinking about what we now have, have are, what we now are talking about in terms of um, Afro-pessimism versus, you know, uh, Black optimism and the differences between what we might, how we might think about those. So to me, it was a really interesting way into a kind of intersection um, of a, a conversation around the relationship between the social and the ontological. Um, so, so uh, you know, I also am not familiar with the the with um, Stephen Schwarbrick, but um, you know, like Amy, I'll be I'll be looking into that work also. But I think I think for me, like that conversation has been import an important one. I don't know that I would say that I come down on any any kind of you know um, that I have a stake in it at the moment as a debate, you know, I think at the moment it's important because it has helped me get to, <laughs> to um, sort of other, other ways of thinking, which I think if I would had to characterize it, I would say it, it comes down to, if, if there is a side, it's a way of trying to think about, you know, what, you know, someone like, uh, you know what this what the sociality is of a kind of um, relation that is not necessarily incorporated into the logics of relationality in an, in a, in any uncomplicated way. I don't know if that actually makes sense, but it, it totally makes sense. I'm just, I'm just sitting in my room and who knows. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, you made me think of a, a, a small rejoinder to my initial uh, attempt to answer this question, and it's this. Um, the Yeah, I also started thinking about my book, Migrant Futures, I think in 2001 was technically the first time that I started writing about speculation, but um, it, it wasn't, and it, yeah, Edelman's No Future and the whole debate around that was, was part of the, another kind of like 
threshold, uh, a different moment um, hurdle to cross um, in the project. But for me, it was, there was an interesting moment in a grad student seminar that I was in when we were reading Edelman, having the debate about no future. I mean, it was in Jack Halverson's classroom for crying out loud, but, um, and uh, we came to this moment where uh, the feeling of being able to opt out or opt in is already wrapped up in questions of race and privilege and the politics of opting out are so informed by the way that racism itself works, right? You might disavow or disidentify, what, you might not to use many of this term, but uh, you might not identify as a person of color, but racism is still doing its work on you, right? And so like that, there's a way that you cannot op opt out. And so the relationality precedes the question of a politics of relationality. In, in, and I think that answer is really profoundly um, meted out again in a lot of indigenous uh, thought as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for the answers to that question and for your un unbelievably wonderful presentations, for joining the Bonin Center for our annual um, Queer Direction series. It was really um, just um, amazing to be able to be in our rooms and outside of them at the same time, right? Through alone together. So, um, so thank you. And um, I know everybody here is clapping with me <laughs> and thanking you as well. Um, uh, and so that brings our evening to a close. Thank you, Dana.